local animal. Hello everyone and welcome to Political Animals, the news and opinion segment of the Commoners podcast. My name is Adam. Today I was scheduled to share my thoughts on Brexit as this week's editorial now that Article 50 has been triggered. But after chatting with John we've decided to elevate Brexit and the triggering of Article 50 to the main podcast. So this Monday make sure you check out our Brexit special where we will dive into how we got to where we are. We'll map out the next couple of years of negotiations and we'll discuss the influence of an anti-EU Trump administration. So don't miss it. In lieu of the Brexit editorial, John will be tackling the plight of Ayaz Nazami, a Pakistani blogger and atheist currently imprisoned after arrest under the country's severe blasphemy and apostasy laws. Where is the Twitter rage now? But first, the news from Europe. Europe is treading anxiously through 2017 between Brexit and a series of major elections that may give rise to the populist right wing, so much so that every sub-national election is being monitored with great interest. In September of this year, Germany is to have a federal election which will see German Chancellor Angela Merkel's grip on power tested. Unpopular decisions like the bailout of the Greek economy and the acceptance of over a million Syrian refugees has the leader of 12 years in a precarious position. Merkel is one of the most powerful people in the world and is viewed by many to be a stable presence in the midst of the minor political revolutions happening around the Western world. She stands steadfast and measured in the fast-paced changes that have taken over the US and the UK in the past year. Naturally then, much interest is being paid to the outcome of the upcoming election to see if the winds of change will blow through the German Chancellery and in what direction. Merkel leads the centre-right Christian Democratic Union, or CDU, in coalition with the centre-left Socialist Democratic Party, or SPD. Now, the SPD have recently elected a man by the name of Martin Schulz, the immensely popular former president of the European Parliament, as their new leader. His appointment led to an increase of 10 percentage points in opinion polling and an increase of SPD membership. Schulz is an ardent EU advocate and offers a centre-left vision of stability. From the left, Schultz poses the biggest threat to Merkel's re-election as Chancellor, and if successful, may be able to create a left-wing coalition with the Greens and a party called the Left in what is being called a Red-Red-Green coalition, with the complete exclusion of Merkel's CDU from power. If successful, German politics will shift hard to the left. Now, from the right, the new party Alternative for Deutschland has been hanging around the 10-14% to range in the national polls. While no threat to the leadership itself, the relative success of this anti-Eurozone, anti-immigration party may pull the weight of the German political spectrum to the right, in the same way that UKIP did here in the UK. With the balance of power at play, many are taking interest in trying to glean as much insight as possible from sub-national elections. While the federal election isn't until September, there are three, well, now two, state elections in the interim, with the first having been held on Sunday in Saarland. Saarland is the smallest state in the German Federation with just under a million inhabitants. It's a gritty industrial state with a wealth of coal and a large mining industry. Saarland was the first test for the quote-unquote Schultz effect, as well as a barometer for how well the right-wing AFD would fare in an actual election. Now, unexpectedly, Merkel's CDU increased their vote share by 5% and won 24 of the 51 seats in the Saarland Landtag. That's a gain of 5 seats. The SPD's vote shrunk by 1%, but they did manage to hold on to all 17 of their seats. And as for the AFD, well, they came in with a paltry 6% of the vote and only 3 seats. The party that fared the worst, however, was the left, dropping 3% of the vote and 2 seats. So what can we learn from Saarland? 1. There was neither a Schultz effect nor any real success for the AFD. Both the SPD and AFD majorly underperformed relative to their polling. Number 2. Before this election, Saarland had been governed by the same CDU-SPD coalition that governs at the federal level, with the CDU as the senior partner and the SPD as the junior partner. The results are being interpreted as popular backing for centrism, 
against a left-wing red-red-green coalition. Number three. Wow, all very well and interesting. This is just Saarland, the smallest of the German states. How well do elections here represent the national average? Well, we're not quite sure. But good statistical practices would require larger sample sizes. To do just that, the next state election is in Schleswig-Holstein on May 7th, which is an electorate of around 2.3 million. But even more so, all eyes will be on North Rhine-Westphalia on May 14th, which will be the most important state election to watch this year, with 13 million voters. Finally, let's go to the story of these fair isles this week here in the UK. On Wednesday, the United Kingdom officially delivered its notice to the European Council that it intends to exit the European Union, triggering Article 50. Now, I won't focus here too much on what that means. You're just going to have to listen to the Commoners podcast on Monday. But I did want to give you a few details of the context of the week in which Article 50 was triggered. Northern Ireland has no government. I covered the Northern Irish elections here on Political Animals a few weeks ago. The election produced a surge in seats for the pro-Irish Republican Sinn Féin and a big loss for the pro-UK Loyalist DUP. The problem is that these two parties are still the biggest parties that represent their respective communities and by law, they have to work together to form a government or there is no government. The parties have been granted an extension by the UK government to keep working on a deal but if issues blocking the formation of a government continue, the UK government will simply assume direct control of Northern Ireland. So, as the UK is about to enter one of the most challenging periods of negotiation, particularly as it involves a land border with the EU and the island of Ireland, Northern Ireland may not have a voice to speak for itself. Next, the Scottish Parliament voted in favour of holding a second Scottish independence referendum, 69-59. to After postponement due to the terror incident in Westminster, the debate over the Section 30 order continued this week. A Section 30 order is a request by the devolved administration in Scotland to take temporary control of a power reserved to the Westminster Parliament, in this case issues regarding the Constitution. The 69-59 result was split neatly along pro- and anti-independence lines, so the SNP and Greens were in favour, and the Conservatives, Labour and the Liberal Democrats were against. And finally, on the back of the terror incident in London last week, the UK's Home Office Minister, Amber Rudd, has been making the rounds on talk shows arguing that government should have access to end-to-end encrypted communication, the likes of which is used by WhatsApp. The Westminster attacker was said to have sent a final message via WhatsApp before the attack and the UK government is keen to acquire that message. The problem is that a backdoor into an individual's encrypted messages is a backdoor into all of our encrypted messages. And I don't want to hear the I've got nothing to hide argument, to quote Edward Snowden, arguing that you don't care about the right of privacy because you've got nothing to hide is no different than saying that you don't care about freedom of speech because you've got nothing to say. So that's it, John. On the week that the UK has signalled its intention to leave the European Union, Northern Ireland has no government, Scotland wants another referendum, and the UK government wants access to our private messages. Nothing but stability here. Over to you. (laughs) This has been quite the few days. Picking up where I left off last week, only hours after Political Animals was released, Paul Ryan was forced to pull the Republican healthcare bill from the floor of the House due to a lack of... Of votes. It was a stinging defeat for a key portion of Trump's agenda as president, and it highlights some serious cracks in the arm of the GOP. Considering that the Republicans have had seven years to come up with a suitable replacement for Obamacare, and seeing as how the, quote, repeal and replace mantra was the foundation of their opposition to President Obama, to come up short on the biggest stage when they control both houses and the presidency can be seen as nothing less than a total failure. The push to repeal the Affordable Care Act seems dead, at least for now. Paul Ryan has teased the idea that Republicans will return to health care later in the year after tax reform, but no timeline has been set. 
This has been seen by many as a sly attempt to undermine Obamacare and increase volatility in health insurance marketplaces. You see, most health insurance companies begin constructing plans and setting prices as early as April for the the end-of-the-year enrollment periods. If Ryan and the GOP dangle the carrot of a repeal long enough, it could cause major uncertainty in the health insurance industry, which could result in higher premiums being locked in well advance of year-end. Either way, it seems that the national debate on health care is far from over. Representative John Conyers introduced a bill, H.R. 676, in January. It's a Medicare for All bill, which would effectively institute a single-payer system in the U.S. At the same time, Senator Bernie Sanders introduced his own single-payer bill in the Senate. This push, coming off the back of Republican failure and a growing support for a Medicare for All system among the American people, could be a flashpoint in shifting the public discourse around health care in general. President Trump himself has come out in support of a single-payer system several times, and these proposals seem like attempts to hold his feet to the fire on that rhetoric. The bills face almost certain defeat, with only 72 of 194 Democratic representatives sponsoring Conyers' bill. It seems unlikely to ever even get a vote. However, if you do live in the United States, I would highly encourage you to call your representative and tell them you will not vote for them unless they sponsor this bill. I did, and who knows, maybe it will make a difference. Something congressional Republicans did manage to succeed at this week was repealing an Obama-era rule that protected Internet consumers' privacy. The rule, which was not yet in effect, would require Internet service providers to obtain consent before selling consumer data to other companies and advertisers. It was an attempt to give Internet users more control over their personal data, but apparently your privacy is less important than corporate profits. This means that everything, your location, search and browser history, application usage, spending habits, and all manner of other metadata will be available to be sold to the highest bidder. In a world with an increasingly invasive NSA and CIA, these protections were the last strands of internet privacy available to consumers. You can expect to get a lot more junk mail and tailored ads in the future. Perhaps there's a niche to be filled by an ISP that would refuse to sell your information under any circumstances. Time will tell. One tiny bit of humor that did come out of the situation, however, as of this recording, protest groups have raised over $200,000 to buy the internet activity of the members of Congress who voted for the repeal. Although ISPs don't generally sell individual information, I find the attempt humorous. In other news, while President Trump signed an executive order dismantling President Obama's climate regulations, which will allow for much higher levels of emissions in coal and gas production, another environmental story flew under the radar this week. On Wednesday, new EPA head Scott Pruitt refused to ban a dangerous pesticide known as Lohr's ban, which has been used by farmers for over 50 years. The EPA actually banned the use of Lohr's ban indoors but only recently pushed the ban in agriculture. This comes despite growing evidence that exposure to Lohr's ban could be responsible for birth defects and nervous system damage. Unsurprisingly, of course, the chemical industry was pleased with this development. Speaking of chemicals, in a move that seemed like a parody of real life, the DEA, that's the Drug Enforcement Administration, approved a synthetic marijuana formulation produced by Insys Therapeutics, despite the fact that whole plant marijuana remains a Schedule One drug. Although the synthetic version uses the exact same active ingredient as whole plant marijuana, the DEA inexplicably gave the Insys product a Schedule II ranking. Or perhaps it's not so inexplicable. You see, Insys donated $500,000 to Arizonans for Responsible Drug Policy, a group that opposed marijuana legalization in Arizona last summer. Perhaps I'm reading into things too much, but that doesn't seem like a coincidence to me. After that news, I genuinely thought the hypocrisy could not get any worse. That is until I read about Ayaz Nazami. Now, please bear with me if I get a little passionate in this editorial, as this is a subject close to my heart. Uh, Ayaz Nazami is the pseudonym for a Pakistani ex-Muslim and atheist blogger who is also the vice president of the Atheist and Agnostic Alliance in Pakistan. You can imagine he's not winning any popularity contests. On March 22nd, Ayaz and a colleague Rana Noman were arrested for posting blasphemous content on online forums, including a Facebook group. 
I'm not one to cast aspersions, but informed listeners will remember that last week Facebook was pressured by the Pakistani government to assist them in reporting, quote, blasphemous posts. I would certainly hope they had nothing to do with this. It seems unbelievable to anyone living in the West that a person could be arrested for simply stating their belief. But this is a real threat for skeptics and unbelievers living in many Middle Eastern and Asian countries. Saudi Arabia, for instance, the head of the UN Human Rights Council, officially recognizes atheists as terrorists. In Pakistan, apparently you'll be arrested for blasphemy. I think the Western idea of extremism is slightly skewed. When we think about extremism, it brings to mind images of ISIS beheadings or people being burned alive in cages. But the fact is that extremism can have further reaching effects than just injury and death to victims. Take for instance what happened shortly after Ayaz Nazami's arrest. The hashtag Hang Ayaz Nazami was actually trending on Twitter. Think about that. I'll read you a few of my favorites. He must be dragged in the streets, then hanged. Islam is the most peaceful religion of the world, but when anyone say wrong about our beloved prophet, he will be hanged. Hashtag hang Ayaz Nizami. And, and, and probably my personal favorite, a terrorist can kill many, but a blasphemous hurt feelings of millions. Hashtag hang Ayaz Nizami. In addition to this, BBC Asia actually tweeted out a video with the question, quote, what is the right punishment for blasphemy? As if blasphemy even warrants a punishment. This is nothing more than a thought crime, a crime that has no human victim, and I would argue has no victim. As an atheist in the United States, I might get sideways looks or, or have religious people post annoying links on my Facebook. But do I have to live in constant fear of arrest or possibly death for what I think? No, absolutely not. I, I'm protected by the First Amendment. I have enormous respect for secularists who live openly in countries that have deemed their existence a crime. They're much braver than I am. But in the West, how do we respond to hashtag hang Aziaz Nizami? Did Twitter ban the accounts that actively called for the execution of another human being over his thoughts? Over his lack of beliefs? No. Listeners of Commoners will know I take a hard line stance on free speech. I am a free speech absolutist. I don't agree with nearly anything that Milo Yiannopoulos says, but he got banned from Twitter for inciting hate against an actress. I'm not saying what he did was justified, but why do we have the double standard? Why must he be silenced? Someone who didn't call for someone's death, but hashtag hang a Yaznazami is allowed. I don't think that either should be censored, but where is the consistency? The left needs to call atrocious things out like this. Moderate Muslims need to call these things out. We need to stop being afraid of offending someone else's feelings for the sake of their religion. I'm offended. I'm offended that we live in a world where someone can be arrested and potentially killed for their belief system or lack thereof. Progressives need to realize that criticizing a religion is not racist. Criticizing an idea is not racist. It's not xenophobic. It's perfectly warranted and logical if those ideas are just objectively bad ideas. Putting somebody in prison for m making a post on Facebook is ridiculous. If we abandon bedrock liberal principles like freedom of thought, of speech, of association, what do we have left? We will have given up on our liberalism in the name of political correctness. I, for one, am not willing to do that. Imagine if a similar hashtag like this was taken up by white supremacists or by conservative right-wing Christians. Hashtag hang Barack Obama. Uh, maybe that's an extreme example because Obama is so famous, but just a, a prominent figure. It would be insane. It would be the top story. Yet all across Asia and Pakistan, people were tweeting hashtag Hang this man <laughs> for, 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 for daring to think something else than the, the most people in that country. It's clear with stories like this that Islam in many parts of the world needs a reformation. How can that reformation happen if we don't acknowledge the shortcomings? I know the temptation is to make excuses to avoid scapegoating Muslims, and that's perfectly valid. 
I'm not calling for rhetoric like Hurt Wilders or Donald Trump. I'm not calling to ban these people. But what I am calling for is a, a conversation talking about how we can liberalize these systems of thought. Because you cannot be liberal and be okay with these sorts of ideas. We cannot not speak out against hashtag hang a Yaz Nizami until we learn that, until we have a realistic view of, of these radical ideologies. And I would say this for any religion. I'm not trying to pick on Islam, but right now this is the one that seems to be causing the most problems. We won't be taken seriously because honestly, I'm, I'm told that I'm not liberal for saying these things. I'm told that I, I'm, I'm xenophobic or even racist for having these ideas. I'm not on any crusade against Islam at all. I'm just saying that changes need to be made if, if we are going to exist in the world with it. And our response as progressives needs to be consistent. If we have outrage against Milo Yiannopoulos and his followers for ganging up and tweeting at an actress and saying horrible, horrible things to this person, then we should have the same reaction to something like this. This poor man <laughs> could potentially be killed. He is now languishing in prison for just speaking his mind. No progressive, no liberal should ever accept living in a world where that happens. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to subscribe and also follow us on Twitter at CommonersPod. The music for today's episode is Drive by Otis McDonald. Please see the link in the description for the rest of his work.